So I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, hello and uh, welcome everyone to Great Plains Quinn Friday Focus for Health. This four week series is going to focus on uh, C. difficile and maybe hospitalizations, readmissions that occur or associated with it. This Friday Focus for Health is hosted by us, the Great Plains Quality Innovation Network. Uh, we are the quality improvement organization for North Dakota and South Dakota. My name is Tammy Wagner. I'm a registered nurse and a quality improvement advisor for the Great Plains Quinn. Along with my co-team here, uh, we have Lori Hintz and Stephanie Maduna and Kelsey Olson is on here helping us with uh, everything uh, related to working things that maybe we need back in. So thank you. We want to thank you all again for joining us today. Today's webinar is going to be recorded and will be posted within one to two business days on our website at greatplainsquin.org under the Friday Focus for Health link. And we're also going to share that link with you. Uh, if you have questions, please add them to chat. We have a resource handout that you can access. And that includes all the resources shared today during both sessions, and it will be added to as the four week uh, sessions occur. So again, during this four week series, we're going to talk about uh, CDI or C. difficile infections related to maybe readmissions, hospitalizations, the impact of CDI, risks for CDI, the spread of CDI, and then prevention measures. Today is about impact. So a little background, C. diff, also known as Clostridioides difficile, used to be Clostridium difficile, or C. difficile, or CDI, is a germ bacterium that causes diarrhea and colitis, or an inflammation of the colon, and it can be life-threatening. It's estimated to cause almost half a million infections in the United States each year. About one in six patients who get C. diff will get it again in the subsequent two to eight week time frame. One in 11 people over age 65 diagnosed with a healthcare associated C. diff infection die within one month. C. diff can affect anyone. Most cases of C. diff occur when you've been taking antibiotics or not long after you've finished taking them. There are other risk factors, and those include being 65 or older, a recent stay at a hospital or a nursing home, a weakened immune system, such as people that have HIV or AIDS, cancer, or organ transplant patients taking immunosuppressive drugs. Also, previous infection with C. diff or known exposure to the germs. Symptoms of C. diff. These symptoms might develop within a few days after you begin taking the antibiotics. Watery diarrhea, fever, stomach tenderness or pain, a loss of appetite, and nausea. CDI or C. difficile infection is the leading cause of healthcare associated infections, accounting for significant disease burden and mortality. Therefore, accurate diagnosis and prevention of CDI is paramount, paramount importance. Here, uh, we just have uh, the impact. This is actually a, a, a PDF on the CDC website that uh, goes over all the things that we're gonna talk about in the next four weeks. And then we also have uh, these resources in the resource document. There is a um, CDI roadmap and toolkit and one specifically for long-term care facilities. Though we don't have specific community-wide or statewide data drilled down yet for uh, the communities in North and South Dakota, we can gauge a bit from our nursing home data that we do get. We have a baseline and then we have this line graph with annual data and we can see that we have had an increase, a, a pretty significant increase in CDI hospitalizations from nursing homes in both North and South Dakota. This is combined together. This graph shows an increase in those residents considered a uh, long stay or those that are there greater than 100 days. And this data is around short stay residents or those with 100 days or less in the nursing home. And what's interesting is that 
you know, when we do look at uh, some of the numerator denominator, one potential reason, although the numbers are very small, is we have seen a real decrease in the time period of the number of residents in the nursing home, but there's still this uh, pretty steep increase of CDI hospitalizations. So this might be something that you want to take a look at. Now we're going to show a short video uh, that talks about the personal impact of CDI. Can you hear it, Kelsey? It. No. I don't know what's going on today with teams. I'm going to try this again. Can you hear? No. Can't hear or see. We can't see your screen either. Oh, thank you. All right. Try this one more time here. I have a stomach. I have gastrointestinal upset on having diarrhea. It? Said she wasn't feeling good. She thought she had caught something from one of the students. She laid in bed for a couple of days, and the ambulance came, and they, uh, they took her vitals and stuff, and they weren't good. As soon as we got to the emergency room, within, I would say, an hour or so, we knew things were not what we thought. They later told us that she had a bacterial infection called Clostridium difficile, which I had never heard of. Certainly several hundred thousand people contract C. diff every year. In terms of deaths, over 25,000 deaths a year. Clostridium difficile is a bacteria that can inhabit the intestine of patients when the normal bacteria that typically fills our intestine and is actually healthy for us are killed off by taking certain antibiotics. When one receives antibiotics, the antibiotics will kill off the good bacteria in our bowels, and the C. difficile is able to multiply, produces toxins, and causes disease. It can happen quite unexpectedly and suddenly, and maybe even within days or a week of taking an antibiotic for a routine procedure, someone could become deathly ill. I had a sinus infection. I went to the ENT who um, gave me an, a, what he calls an aggressive form of tr antibiotic treatment for my sinus infection. Within about two days, I knew that something wasn't right. I was on vacation in Paris, and I started getting diarrhea every morning. And it got worse as the days went on. And when I got back, it got much worse, much more frequent, and was kind of keeping me from pretty much living my life. I was afraid to go outside. I didn't realize that at 35 that I could be so sick that I needed to be hospitalized. Anyone who takes an antibiotic, whether it's in the hospital setting or in the outpatient medical setting or even in the community, should be uh, vigilant and aware that they are susceptible to acquiring Clostridia difficile. With antibiotics being used more and more frequently, um, that is predisposing patients to develop C. difficile. Now, we do need to take antibiotics. I am absolutely not recommending to people that they don't treat their pneumonia and their sinus infections. What we are for is the prudent use of antibiotics and for doctors to fully warn the people they prescribe them to about their potential side effects, and for patients to question whether or not they need them. 
and particularly to not ask for them for a cold or a viral infection or something that they actually don't do anything for. For many, many years, I had these mega doses of antibiotics. And nobody ever said, restore your gut flora with probiotics. Nobody, and I didn't know anything about this. If a patient is given a traditional antibiotic, we would also recommend they take something called a probiotic or yeah. friendly flora. This way, when they're wiping out the, all the bacteria from the, with the antibiotic, the friendly flora is being replaced at the same time. Healthy flora helps with our immune system and it helps digest our foods. So it's going to give a lot of health benefit as well as potentially keep infection down. It took me three weeks to really fully recover my strength, my appetite. He gave me fluids, fluids to replenish myself and I had high doses of probiotics to help me heal. The treatment for Clostridia difficile, ironically, is to give yet another antibiotic, which is somewhat counterintuitive, but is still the treatment of choice. She went into the hospital to get better, you know, and to have the surgery because my sister's son was getting married and she wanted to be able to go to the wedding and enjoy herself at the wedding. No one tells you that the chances of you getting C. diff are great when you walk into a hospital. C. diff is the fastest growing hospital infection in the United States. And in some parts of the country, it's also the most prevalent. It is just so much easier to spread it. Because Clostridia difficile lives as a spore and can land on an inanimate object somewhere in a room, uh, in a bathroom, on a bed rail. How do patients get C. diff? Well, they touch contaminated surfaces in the hospital. The C. diff spores, which are invisible, get on their hands. Then they either inadvertently touch their lips or their meal tray comes and they pick up their cookie or their roll and eat it, ingesting those C. diff spores along with their food. Patients can do so much to protect themselves from C. diff just by keeping their own hands cleaned, especially before they eat. Healthcare workers have to be very careful to wash their hands with soap and water because even alcohol-based rinses don't kill Clostridia difficile. You should feel very comfortable the way you would asking your healthcare provider whether or not he or she washes her hands or his hands. And the research shows that if you clean the high touch surfaces right around the patient's bed with bleach soaked wipes once a day, you can reduce Clostridium difficile 75%. We didn't really know about that at the no, time. No, nobody mentioned anything. I know we had to wear gowns and gloves, but nobody ever said anything. The doctors thought she was doing well at yeah. the end, but little did they know that the C. diff was still there. It never really went away. Yeah. It's extremely important that hospitals track C. diff and other hospital infections and report the incidents. We take C. difficile seriously because it prolongs length of stay in the hospital. It affects not just our most vulnerable patients, but some of our healthiest patients. And if you have to go to the hospital, of course you want to know which hospital in your area has the lowest infection rates, including the lowest rates for C. diff. A key thing I want everybody to know is that C. diff and C. diff infections are largely preventable. She was all about education and knowledge and being your own best advocate. And um, you can't be your own best advocate unless you have the information. We must be more informed about C. diff. It's a serious condition, but with knowledge, you know, it, it can be tackled. It can be brought under control. One of our first goals in starting the foundation was creating an internet hub for people to find information plainly written that they could understand. People don't have to die from this, you know? No family needs to go through what we went through. There's absolutely no reason for it. This is something that we can fight. Like if we measure it, if we study it, if we report it, and if we agree that we're going to not let people die from a preventable disease, we can change it. Help and C. diff now. Please go to peggyfoundation.org. So I know it was a little longer video, but we felt it was impactful. And again, it's a little older. The last couple of years, they changed the name to Clostridioids, difficile, uh, and they still reference Clostridium. So 
Um, so as we have in all of our series, we would like to continue to share age-friendly health systems, and they did a great job uh, in the last one if you were able to attend talking about opioids. But if you haven't heard of age-friendly health, it is an initiative uh, the John A. Hartford Foundation, the uh, American Hospital Association, Catholic Health Association of the United States designed to meet the challenge head on of our increased need to have age friendly care. Age friendly health systems aims to follow an essential set of evidence based practices, cause no harm and align with what matters to the older adult and their family caregivers. So becoming an age-friendly health system entails like, providing a set of four evidence-based elements of high-quality care known as the four M's to all older adults in your system. So it's what matters, medication, and mentation, and mobility. And we're going to watch this short video to learn more about age-friendly health. Just making sure you can still hear Let's take a closer look at each of the four M's. In order to meet the care needs of older adults, understanding their health goals and preferences is crucial. This includes assessing, documenting, and acting on what older adults say that matters to them. Focusing on what matters introduces opportunities to know and align care with specific health outcome goals and preferences. Addressing what matters extends across all care settings. What matters includes but is not limited to end-of-life care. It is vital to have an ongoing conversation with older adults and their family caregivers about medication. Focusing on medication helps formalize check-ins to review high-risk medication use, de-prescribe or choose not to prescribe medications that are high risk for older adults, and ensure medications do not interfere with the other M's, what matters, mentation, and mobility. With mentation, the goal is to monitor the mental and cognitive well-being of older adults, document concerns, and address changes. Focusing on mentation includes efforts to prevent, identify, treat, and manage dementia, depression, and delirium. With mobility, the goal is to ensure that older adults move safely every day to improve function and to do what matters to them. Focusing on mobility reinforces the importance of older adults' ability to move. This can ensure early and safe mobility in the hospital, assess and manage impairments that reduce mobility and lead to falls, create a home environment that is safe for mobility, identify a daily mobility goal that supports what matters, and monitor progress toward the mobility goal. So, Maybe asking how does C. diff relate to the age friendly, but it, it really does. When you're talking about medications, did that person receive antibiotics that were unnecessary that led to the C. diff infection or recurrence? Does that person what matter to them? Obviously, they don't want to have diarrhea. They don't want to have an infection. So are our infection prevention practices uh, up to par? Uh, mentation, did that person get dehydrated? have delirium? Do they have depression because the C. diff infection keeps reoccurring and they're having constant watery stools that is embarrassing, difficult to uh, manage on their own? And that mobility piece where the impairment that comes with dehydration or not feeling well, well the watery stools, potential falls that could occur. Many more things can come to mind and age-friendly health is thinking about these things in every setting with every older person every time, and it all correlates to really what matters to that person. So this week, we'd like to share just a couple of resources. We'll have more in the coming weeks, um, but they might be helpful as you navigate a quality improvement project related to C. diff, 
uh, C. diff hospitalizations, C. diff readmissions, antibiotic stewardship. Uh, this example of a CDI prevention and control policy is a good template to use if you don't already have one. Uh, and if you do, you might want to just look at this one compared to yours and see if there's anything that is missing or if it aligns well. So this it will be in the resource um, document. And then GB Quinn uh, developed this decision tree for diarrhea management that staff in healthcare organizations can use to be sure that they understand, you know, first what stool may need to be tested and what doesn't need to be tested, uh, isolation needs and cleaning procedures. As we prepare to leave an action, we're going to take a look at the QI guide with the collection of quality improvement tools. And I know Carrie did a great job in the last one, so I'm not going to open it up again, but um, it can be used for absolutely any uh, performance improvement project that that you have going on. So and it's a nice way to track everything in one uh, one document, Excel template. Um, so examples. When you're building a team, which is what you need to do first, would be uh, for C. diff, uh, environmental services, obviously, pharmacy, um, and administration, care staff from the floor, uh, laboratory, and medical staff, and of course, your infection preventionist. The next thing you would do is review and analyze your data and then use your contributing factors to state the problem in specific terms. These problem statements uh, can be used to identify evidence-based strategies for you to implement. A problem statement should encompass the what, who, where, and why. And just an example, a very simple one is, you know, the what is, for example, uh, CDI hospitalizations and who your residents or patients where residing at or being admitted to the indicator you look at your past month, your past quarter, or your past year. The why is related to the data that you found. And keep in mind any marginalized populations and make sure that you're extracting and analyzing your data in this way, such as age, gender, disability, race. Are there inequities? The root cause analysis select factors that apply, you can review 10% of your, your, like we saw, it could be short stay or long stay residents that have increased in CDI, those transfers that are going back, or look at your antibiotic stewardship um, practices. Uh, you, you can choose anything, but again, identify one issue or problem at a time and those small incremental changes. Now we're going to move on. We'll look at my time. We have about uh, seven minutes. We're going to move into our office hours portion. And again, this is a time for you to ask questions of your peers and us, the GP Quinn uh, QI advisors, but also share any barriers or successes, lessons learned around reducing C. diff, reducing C. diff hospitalizations, um, your antibiotic stewardship program. Regardless if you're from a clinic, home health, hospital, nursing home, to our own family situations, we all have likely experienced a uh, C. diff infection in some way. So as you reflect on this, if you have an experience to share, please do so by taking yourself off mute or just share in the chat. And while we wait, I just want to um, talk a little bit about, uh, we have a Q-tips for your ears podcast series as well. There's many topics and they are short and targeted to educate your residents, your families, your patients in clinics or hospitals. Um, the one that I am highlighting is the C. difficile uh, podcast, and I think Kelsey is going to go ahead and put the link to our podcast series in the, the chat, but it is called C. difficile, what everyone needs to know, and it's around nine minutes long. It's quick, easy to talk a little bit about antibiotic stewardship and C. diff and uh, what the community, the people, the end, the end people, the patients, the residents can do to protect themselves from C. diff. 
um, and discuss, you know, why awareness is important, signs and symptoms, how to prevent the infections. Um, it's just good, it's good short education for a lay person. Other topics in there are diabetes, vaccines, the great American smokeout, antibiotic use, uh, self-measured blood pressure monitoring, uh, opioids, adverse drug events, and chronic kidney disease, and we're adding to that um, in the near future. Okay, so do we have any anyone that wants to speak, or do we have anything in chat right now? Nothing in chat at this time, Tammy. Okay. Uh, this is Lori. And I, I got to think, and I'm wondering if, if one of the reasons that we are seeing an increase in CDI is that over the last, you know, since COVID, maybe our cleaning strategies have changed. And we weren't really paying it, paying as I mean, I know we were cleaning for COVID, but of course, cleaning for C, C. diff is different. Yeah. So just something that crossed my mind here. I thought I would bring up. Yeah, for sure. And I don't know if other people have other ideas as to why we're seeing an increase in, in C. diff. I know internally we've talked about, you know, before there were vaccines, before you know we really had good testing i i think the symptoms were broad enough that physicians were probably throwing a lot of antibiotics out there uh, for patients to take so um i know that was one thing that we talked about would be potential reasons for the increase in cdi uh, hospitalizations, but if someone else has another, we'd love to hear it. All right, I do have a poll that I'm going to put out there if you guys wouldn't mind. So Launch. So just asking if your organization is currently working on anything related to C. diff, just examples if you're looking to reduce your C. diff, C. diff readmissions and hospitalizations, or antibiotic stewardship. So yes, no, or unsure. If you could complete that, we'll just take about 15 seconds wait for those to come in. Okay, so looks like it slowed down. Looks like great, 67% uh, are working on something, one of those. And about 33% uh, are not. And hopefully we're spurring you to think about um, working on a C. diff or antibiotic stewardship project. Then if you are, I'm going to launch another poll. If you're working on a performance improvement project, as noted in that last question, where are you at in your effort? So are you at the planning stage? Are you building your team? Are you analyzing your data? Have you implemented an intervention that, and now you're monitoring progress? Or are you spreading intervention throughout? Or you are not working on any of these? You've just identified it as maybe an issue. So again, we'll take about 15 seconds. One response. Maybe that means none of the above. All 
All right. Well, we have one, one response. Well, we thank you guys very much for attending, being mindful of your time. We're going to end for today and hope to see you back here next week. Please complete the webinar evaluation so we can continue to work to make our time together valuable. We really do appreciate your feedback. Attendees will be dropped off at the end of the evaluation at the conclusion of this. I don't think you do get dropped off at the uh, conclusion of this call. You need to use the QR code or you can use the link that Kelsey's putting in chat and complete the evaluation for both. If you attended both today, the one from 12 to 1230 on opioids or strategies uh, and this one. And uh, then as always, we really value your feedback on these focus for health uh, sessions and any ideas on future topics that you'd like us to cover. We're here for you. We're always free. Um, so we just want to help you in any way we can. So thanks again for joining us joining us and enjoy your weekend. Bye.